Hello, good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, Excelling the Customer Experience in a Zero Trust World, a discussion led by Mike Bamba, Progress Senior Principal Solutions Architect and 36-year veteran of the Department of Defense. My name is Evan Flugrat, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's discussion. Before we begin today's demonstration, I want to draw to your attention the questions panel, which you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. You may need to expand the panel by clicking the plus sign or down arrow for full view. We will take your questions at the end of the demonstration, uh, but you are encouraged to submit your questions at any time today. Today's session is being recorded and will be made available to attendees after its conclusion. You will receive an email um, with the video for you to download. Again, please submit your questions in the chat and Mike will answer those following the conclusion of this demonstration. I will now invite Mike to come on and lead today's presentation. Mike, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody. Um, I'm gonna go and get started into this. The, I apologize up front, I'm using a rather, rather wordy deck, but zero trust in the uh, US government perspective uh, is um, pretty well documented as to what it means, but uh, we have a lot of manufacturers uh, who uh, have all spun it around their products, trying to convince you their product is the answer to zero trust. Uh, zero trust is an architecture. It's a new way of doing business uh, from a security perspective. I'm going to get into that now. Uh, in zero trust, uh, to compare and contrast, uh, in the architectures that a lot of us have lived in our, our, our lives, you would in the old days, you would walk in, you would sign into your computer, and after you signed into your computer, you would have access to all of the resources uh, that were you were granted. Uh, you wouldn't have to authenticate a second time in most cases to get to resources, but that world has been changing over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and the most obvious thing that you saw while the world changed was the fact that you now have uh, a lot of passwords you need to remember because a lot of systems that are not internal to your organization are now critical to your organization and you're using them as a service. And it's not all integrated seamlessly. But authentication used to be done once. And then most of the resources in your organization were granted to you based upon your authorization, whatever rights you had in that, in that organization. Uh, in zero trust, authentication is done continuously. It's not done just once when you sign on, it's done as you access resources within the network. Uh, and that, that authentication process uh, is going to exercise your authentication infrastructure and authorization infrastructure a lot more than it has been in the past. So as we look at zero trust, as this discussion goes forward, one of the things I'm gonna to wanna to point out to you is uh, areas where what you have today may be, may be insufficient to meet your requirements as you move towards zero trust. Um, access control, so uh, uh, authentication, authorization, access. So these are the three pieces that have to take place before you should be granted uh, access to any information. Uh, and they're also going to be done at more than one point in the network. Um, not only do you have to authenticate to the network uh, in a zero trust model, but your device needs to authenticate to the network. Uh, in many cases, many organizations are going to use some methodology for device authentication that includes device health checks to make sure they meet a minimum standard before the device is allowed to send information back and forth across the network. Uh, if, if you have a problem with the, the, this, the infrastructure that supports this, authentication authorization or device access control systems, if they become overwhelmed, uh, with requirements, with, with demand on them, uh, or you have one that is not working while, while the rest of them do, if you haven't designed your system properly, you're going to have a percentage of your customers that are going to have a bad experience. They're going to either not be allowed access or they're going to have very slow access or their access is going to be uh, indeterminate. It'll be good one day and bad the next day or a good one hour, bad the next hour, or even within minutes it could change as far as performance goes. If you see these types of behaviors uh, for customer experience impacts within zero trust, 
it's probably because your infrastructure is not robust enough to handle the requirements. And by robust enough, I mean it needs to know what's working and what's not, and it needs to make sure users, the infrastructure, that plumbing is all being directed to pieces of your uh, infrastructure, your security uh, components that are working properly. So zero trust, uh, it's the, it, the, according to NIST, National Institute of Standards, Special Publication 800-207, this is their, their definition of zero trust. You know, it's an evolving set of cyber security paradigms, which means we don't know everything that's going to be in there yet. Uh, and of course, that's always true in cybersecurity. You don't know what your end state's gonna look like because you're constantly having to modify it to meet a new and emerging threat environment. It assumes there's no implicit trust granted. It means you don't sign in once and get access. It, it means that your device, because it is connected to your network, isn't automatically considered a safe and secure device. It has to be validated as well. And the foundational tenet, and this is from the DOD reference architecture for zero trust, is that no thing, no actor, no system, no network, no service, is considered um, trusted. Instead, we must verify anything and everything attempting to act, establish access. Well, it's really establish that anything and everything attempting to access data. So the information that, they, that the customer wants to, to access. The major paradigm shift on zero trust is we're going from a perimeter-based security model to a distributed security model where security decisions are being made throughout the entire architecture. And they're being made across more than one component in the architecture. It's not just you and your password. It's much more than that now that, that are being considered as part of the model. Um, there in a, in a true zero trust deployment, you won't hear the term trusted network and untrusted network. That's not gonna happen anymore because everything is an untrusted network and all devices are considered untrusted devices and the level of trust they're granted needs to be based upon validation that they're worthy of being granted that level of trust whether it's an individual or it's a, or it's a device a computer or a tablet a mobile device, a phone whatever it is um, zero trust uh, implements to do a lot of this there's going to be some especially in your authentication, authorization, and access control framework, those components, there's gonna be a lot of activity because it's gonna be continuously requesting validation of who you are, of what you are, uh, what you're trying to access, and whether you access rights to that, to that thing you're trying to access. Um, to do that uh, is a little tricky uh, because especially for a lot of the folks in the US government where what they've done is they've moved to a authentication model for users that's based upon a certificate, an X509 V3 certificate. You probably know it as a CAT card or a PIV card, uh, or maybe a USB token that has a certificate on it that you're using. But these certificate-based access models, uh, the way they typically work when you access a resource on the network, like a website, is that certificate is presented when you first do your very first security handshake for establishing an encrypted connection, a TLS connection, an HTTPS based connection. Uh, if you have, like most of us do, uh, multiple tiers in the architecture getting to that web server, uh, you, if you consume that certificate too early in the process, grab it at a firewall make a user validate with the certificate at a firewall that same certificate can't be used easily and in most cases can't be used at all to authenticate to the website because the firewall basically ate the certificate they created the tls connection and that negotiation process is what requested the certificate and then you're done you're now connected to the firewall with tls you're not connected to the back end server and that's not going to work uh, there are mechanisms other than certificate based for multi factor authentication. Uh, you've heard of perhaps of SAML, maybe OAuth, to OIDC, which are token based authentication mechanisms, which are uh, portable across the network, which means I can use that same token 
to authenticate at multiple places as I go through the network and I don't have to recreate the token, I can obtain the token and use that token more than once. So as you look at how you're going to do zero trust from a authentication perspective, you're gonna to need to take a really hard look at how your authentication framework is set up today. And if you're based entirely upon certificate-based authentication, you're going to need to make some modifications. So what are the five major tenets in zero trust? One is assume hostile environment. Assume the people, uh, the, 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 the user trying to connect, assume that user, uh, their credentials have been compromised. Assume the device that's trying to connect to your network has been compromised. Assume, don't assume any level of trust based upon the user or the device or where they connect in. It's inside the network or coming in from outside the network. Don't assume anything basically in a zero trust environment. Uh, expect that, that either the device or the device or the user's credentials or something within the network itself has been compromised. So build your information systems and solutions around this concept of not everything inside that path to that information is going to be trustworthy. Um, this is where I mentioned earlier about continuous verification and validation. For some components in your architecture, which used to work just fine for signing on once in the morning, are going to are not going or going to start falling down uh, because of the demand placed upon them to authenticate more than just once across the network. Uh, scrutinize explicitly. Uh, this means check, check the health of the device as much as you can, as it connects to the network from whatever method it uses to connect to the network. So, uh, does the device have current antivirus signatures on it? Is the antivirus package working properly? When was the last antivirus scan done looking for hostile code? These are going to be really common checks that you're going to want to put on devices as they connect into your network. Do you have the latest patches from um, the, the, the OS provider or the application provider? Um, you know, those things, are there any indications of compromise? You know, is, is that device trying to beacon out to a control network? Is it trying to do something that it would not normally do as a user con device consuming data on behalf of the user? And if it is, then recognize those the behavioral changes and uh, take action accordingly. And this unified analytics is really important as well. I mean, what, what we have in the past is a lot of um, information assurance technologies, which are relatively good by themselves, but we don't have a lot. Uh, we've tried with um, um, SEIM solutions, security event and incident management solutions to try to aggregate uh, information from multiple devices to try to provide a holistic view. But we're still, the, all of that was still based upon a device centric security model, uh, not a network centric, not, a, not, not something that looked across everything. Uh, and then we created gaps in, the, in, in your knowledge. You might know what was happening at, a, at one point in your network. You might know what's happening at one enclave in your network with relative good precision, but you don't know what's happening across your network horizontally. Uh, and you don't know what's happening vertically within your network in each of the different enclaves in your network because the, the technology to do that, while it exists, it's cumbersome and it's expensive uh, and, it's, and, it, it, and it just takes too much manpower, too much resources. <clears throat> so you made decisions based upon risk management. You said, I can afford to do something here. I can't afford to do it there. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and that leaves big gaps, big dark spots in what, what's happening in, in your networks. As we've seen, the insider threats become much more prevalent. Uh, whether it's insider threat because somebody's machine was compromised uh, when they went to the coffee shop and they brought the, brought the hostile code in with them, whether it's somebody who's deliberately trying to take information, an employee which you've notified, you know, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to let you go in 30 days. And the next thing you know, your entire customer database has been extracted and, and gone. Um, or at least a copy of it's been made and he's now using that to help a competitor. Try to, to sell your products, sell their products that compete against you. 
in the world of DOD, you know, we're talking secrets in most cases, whether they're confidential or they're FOUO on unclassified networks, uh, or uh, they're, they're the very high levels of trust in, in classified networks. Uh, zero trust uh, is intended to be applied across all networks, not intended to just for the unclassified networks in the government. It's intended to deal with requirements in the classified networks, to deal with the manning problem, right, where you don't, don't want to have one bad employee go ahead and pull a bunch of secrets out and then go ahead and start selling them to WikiLeaks. So how do you deal with the insider threat? Well, in, in closed networks, you will need to put the same types of technologies in place that you will see in the open networks related to zero trust. <clears throat> um, zero trust has been defined in pillars. Uh, it's a way to sort of uh, visualize what all the different components are inside of a zero trust environment. So there's a user pillar, a device pillar, a network environment pillar, an application and workloads pillar, and then a data pillar. These are the five primary pillars. When you hear somebody talking about zero trust pillars, those are the five primary pillars they're talking about. Um, the uh, capabilities, visibility and analytics, automation and orchestration, these things are all part of zero trust, but they're not part of a pillar. They're cross-functional. Um, Think of them as horizontals across all of the pillars. So you need to have visibility analytics across all of those five pillars. You need to have automation orchestration across all of those pillars. Uh, encryption, absolutely end-to-end -end encryption being a, a very standard process that needs to be implemented consistently throughout the architecture. And then uh, access controls based upon more than just who you are. So uh, are also going to be required. Because the zero trust model uh, wants to collect information from all these pillars, uh, how it analyzes that information is going to be really important. So uh, the beginnings, uh, if you don't get machine learning built into the products you're buying today, then you're going to be way behind the power curve. Uh, if you're getting uh, artificial intelligence based functionality built into your products and you're uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, so you'll need to work on these um, the key, key components that are not related to how do I see what's happening in Active Directory, but how do I learn about what that means? So I can see it, now how do I know what that means? Uh, can I take a user's identity and attach it to an IP address and track it through the entire network, through all the NAT transitions that take place where my IP address may change? Uh, so that I know that when that user is accessing uh, an application that I can actually attribute that access all the way back to the user. Can I do that? Well, that's going to be done through information fusion, through collection of data at multiple points in the network and analysis of that information. So it's in each pillar, authentication, authorization, and access control. You know, on the user side of it, you're going to see that. On the device side, authentication, authorization, and compliance. You need to know that you're authorized, and that could be a machine-based certificate. Could be, you know, comply to connect. It used to be a term that was used uh, about 10 years ago uh, that uh, is kind of fits right into this category on device-based uh, access controls. So you come onto a network, you the, the check your device. If your device isn't compliant, doesn't meet the minimum standards, uh, you have a choice. You can throw them off and tell them, hey, go fix it and come back later, which is not likely going to happen. Or you can put them over into a remediation zone, a place of your network specifically set up that allows uh, you to help them become compliant. If it's their device, uh, you can't more than likely patch it for them, but you can take them someplace, a website, direct them to that that says, you know, before you can access our information systems, you need to apply the following patches. <clears throat> or you need to at least to have the, your antivirus signatures updated. So uh, device compliance is going to be really important in the zero trust model. Uh, in networking environment, uh, you've heard the term uh, micro segmentation, uh, macro segmentation. Um, it's we're, we're talking about now having uh, perhaps each and every subnet across your network, or even perhaps smaller components than that be separately contained and require access, access decisions to go from one uh, segment to another segment of your network. 
So uh, while you might have access to a segment where your email system is on, that same seg you might not have access to the segment where your uh, website is on or where your Microsoft Teams site is on or, or whatever else you have in your infrastructure, your HR systems, your finance systems, your logistics systems, your command and control systems. Those may be all on different micro, micro segments of your network and to gain access to the, to the service, you first have to gain access to the segment. So there'll be a lot of decisions based upon how do you get into a zone where your applications are actually residing. So more authentication, more authorization, more uh, decision-making taking place in those areas. Um, so when the area of applications and workloads, uh, you know, we've got uh, a lot of stuff in here that's listed. The software supply chain is an interesting one where the government's actually beginning to ask for a software bill of material. You know, how is this application built? You know, where are the, what are the components inside of the application that actually comprise the application? You know, uh, they're asking for um, validation of corporate uh, identity. Uh, in that respect, you know, are you influenced uh, by foreign entities? What's your investor uh, portfolio look like? Uh, is it possible that somebody in China or Russia could exert influence on your company to the point that you would actually modify your code and become a danger to the customer uh, because of that uh, relationship with your investors or your leadership in your company? So those things are being looked at a lot more often now too, and then any type of acquisition decision. So if, you, if you're in industry and you're wondering what you need to do, well, make sure your company knows they're gonna have to go through one of these investigative uh, discussions uh, where they're gonna have to disclose uh, information that is beyond what they're required to disclose uh, to the Security Exchange Commission, to the SEC. Um, data, um, it can't be stressed too lightly the challenges that our customers have been seeing, uh, all of us have been seeing related to uh, ransomware over the last few years. It's just been exploding in the, in the world. Uh, people get in, they'll go ahead and make a copy of your data, which means what do they do? They take your data off of your systems and copy it into their systems. Then they'll encrypt your data on your systems and then they'll send you an email saying, hey, if you want access, uh, pay us. Uh, and if you don't pay us, then give us money so we don't give your information out to the world. <laughs> and if you don't do that, well, then your information is going to be in the breeze, in, in, in the wild. So whether it's, uh, you know, financial, logistics, healthcare, uh, um, PII, personally identifiable information, uh, or it's uh, corporate uh, knowledge that's being lost, that's happening on a regular basis. Well, in dealing with ransomware, uh, the traditional traditional models for security are not going to work. They haven't worked. They're going to continue to fail. You can't expect an antivirus package on somebody's PC to actually be ahead of the game all the time and be able to stop that attack before it actually starts executing on their computer to exfiltrate data. It's not going to happen. It hasn't happened before. It's not going to happen in the future. You still need to have these tools to go ahead and minimize risk but it's not gonna solve the ransomware problem. You're gonna to have to have copies of your data securely archived. You're gonna to have to have them put someplace where they can be recovered. You're gonna to have to have technology in your network that actually sees the data exfiltration. The first step you know, of a ransomware, maybe the second step of a ransomware attack is exfiltrating data. The first step is trying to share its payload with all the other devices in your network, trying to share the, the love. So if your infrastructure isn't designed to watch what's happening on your network horizontally across your end user devices to see that ransomware type traffic signatures, then you're not going to get ahead of the problem. You're going to be behind the problem. Um, it is possible. We've had success stories where customers have been able to see early on the indicators of a single machine that had a ransomware payload deposited on it, beginning the process of trying to share the love, trying to pass that payload sideways. And they've been able to get to that machine and shut it down before they had a loss of data, before they had to worry about having to pay a, a, a criminal to 
get their information back. It didn't happen because of their uh, of what they would have put in place 10 or 15 years ago from a security architecture perspective. So if you're thinking they were able to use something they bought 10 years ago and spin it somehow to see if this ransomware attack, it's not what happened. They used technologies that were designed to look across the entire network and pull out who's talking to who and what are they talking about, you know? And that information then was able to be used very quickly to see uh, the attack. They were also, we've also had customers be able to see employees trying to pull large amounts of data from systems they do, do, did not normally pull data from in that volume uh, and tie it back to you know, uh, an insider threat, somebody trying to take data and lead with the company's data. So the technology to see that, the visibility, this whole idea of visibility and analytics is so incredibly important inside of the zero trust model. It cannot be, uh, there's no way to, to not make that in the very important point for this discussion. Uh, what is this uh, user authentication authorization, privileged access management? You, most of you know this already. I'm gonna limit this pretty quickly. Um, so basically we need to know who the user is, what they're trying to access, what their rights are, and then we're, the government and the industry as a whole has been living in this role-based access controls for a long time, but activity-based access controls are becoming more important uh, and they are gonna get blended into the zero trust model. So you'll be watching for changes in authentication, I'm sorry, in authorization uh, that, are, that are moving in, in that area. So watch for that as, as you're building out your infrastructure. Uh, device, comply to connect. Um, I did comply to connect at Redstone Army Arsenal, uh, and uh, God bless the the Duum, the Director of Information Management out there, because it was not a simple thing to do. Um, it, but this was, I don't know, 15 years ago. Comply to connect was still available 15 years ago. So we went out, we did the uh, actual installation of the technology, we did all of the validation and vetting, we did all of the proof of concepts, all of the early adopters, a uh, limited rollout, all of that stuff worked just fine. We put it into production, we had 15% of the people in a remediation network. And some of those were high ranking individuals, did not work out well. So we had to back out, we had to look at it some more to figure out what we needed to do. But the, the key is you're going to have a need in zero trust for the device authentication authorization and compliance. The technology is relatively mature in this space. You should not have a problem finding a good vendor to work with in this area of comply to connect. Macro segmentation and micro segmentation, um, you know, whether it's policy based networking that you're going to start seeing a lot more of uh, or it's the simple you know, segmentation of everything. For example, uh, a load balancer today can go ahead and have on logically on one side of it could have 10 or 20 network segments, uh, an individual network segment assigned to each application, it's load balancing. And it can have front end that the user connects into. So you end up with this model where all the back end components all live on little micro segments of the network. They don't talk to each other if one gets compromised, it can't compromise the one next to it because it doesn't have access to the one next to it. It's not one big happy family inside of the data center. They're all chopped up into little pieces so that you can make sure that when, when something bad happens to one of your applications or application servers, it can't cause something bad to happen to another one uh, in, in that data center. So that's the goal for, for the segmentation structures is contain the exploit at the lowest possible level possible. Uh, applications and workload, this is why you're doing everything, right? You're, the reason that you, all of this stuff, you don't put a network together just for a network. You know, we put it together to give people access to knowledge and to information. We don't put application servers in and we don't buy applications to put on those servers just because we like the applications. We do it because behind that is information, is knowledge that the user needs to do their job. So applications and workloads uh, are really important in this model. Um, and because we go to micro segmentation and we don't wanna impact the user's experience too greatly, we wanna try to minimize that or maybe make it zero, the impact of users um, uh, experience gaining access to the application and data they wanna gain access to. 
you need to focus on your application uh, environment. It's not simply I've got an application environment. Now I'm applying zero trust. That's not it. Your application environment is part of what you're applying is when you do zero trust. So you've got to look at things like proxies, you know, like load balancers, like uh, zero trust access points uh, or access gateways. Um, you need to look at a lot that's going on inside. You want to start talking to the software manufacturers about software bill of materials. You know, who all is and what all goes into this code, because more than likely the code you're buying, uh, 15, 20, 30 percent of it is developed by the person you're buying it from. And the other rest of it is imported from someplace else. Uh, and you'll need it. If you really want to know if, it, if it's going to be secure or not, you'll want to know the whole environment. Is it, is it sure? Is it secure or not? Uh, data, we talked about this a little bit already. Um, the, and so, but in the zero trust world, because we're talking about now um, controlling access to, to the lowest possible component in the overall architecture through authentication authorization and access controls, then uh, you're going to be wanting to look at what can you do in your data environment. For databases that are tied into application servers as part of a three-tier architecture, more than likely that first tier, the, the user access tier, is still going to be where you're going to be applying most of your work, control access to the backend data. But it's not the only type of data we have out there. We have a lot now that's working in this space of object storage. You know, when, my, when the, um, Amazon came out with S3 storage and made it so incredibly inexpensive, a lot of people began moving into this idea of let's use object-based storage uh, to go ahead and meet our requirements. Uh, they, the, a lot of that movement then got, they, if you watched the, the dynamics for S3, uh, moving data into it was very inexpensive. Pulling data out was relatively expensive and customers began to understand that it wasn't the total answer for storage of data. It was part of the answer for storage of data. It was a great place for archiving. You needed to go and pull a backup of what of your, of your environment, pulling it from S3 was a great way to do so. But if you wanted to access that information and process it, uh, it was not a great way to do so. So other manufacturers came online uh, to build uh, edges um, to this cloud storage. And the edges, you use the same protocols, but now they sat on your networks and they offered you much, much faster response times. And then you could actually run applications against the data sets, but not have to worry about different data standards. You know, one data standard for inside the data center, one data center for, standard for outside the data center. Uh, the applications having to understand multiple data standards, you know, it became complicated. So, they, so it became easier uh, and more efficient for customers to put in edges to cloud-based storage. So anyway, uh, the bottom line is those objects can be individually protected. Uh, there's technology out there, digital rights management, uh, that can go ahead and encrypt an object in an object store. Think of it as a Word document, as an example. And if a user wants to open that Word document, they have to request access to it through a system which verifies who they are, what they are, where they are, and if they still have access to that information. So that information lives in an encrypted format. It doesn't live unencrypted. It can't be unencrypted. It's not designed to be unencrypted. It's encapsulated in such a way it can't be unencrypted. So the only way to access it is by decrypting it. And the only way you can decrypt it is if you get granted access to it. So when you leave the company, your access is revoked. If you change your job within the company, your access is revoked. And you, you may have that file sitting on your computer, but you can't get to it. You can't do anything with it. So now think about the Manning problem. You know, if all of that data that had been pulled off those systems, if somebody could have simply set, a, set one flag on his account that says no longer authorized access, he could not have accessed any of it, couldn't have viewed any of it, couldn't have printed any of it. So that level of technology exists today. So how we're dealing with data security is going to be important in a zero trust model. Uh, visibility and analytics, we talked about this a good deal already, um, the, but the real bottom line is you can't manage what you can't see. You know, and today we have a lot of blind spots inside of our networks. Uh, and in the zero trust world, you just can't, you, you, it's not feasible to have a, a zero trust architecture 
without having full visibility of what's happening horizontally and vertically across your network. You can have pieces of it. You can put an access gateway in over here. You can put a comply to connect over there, but it's not really, it, it's pieces of zero trust. It's not zero trust. Uh, because you need to know when that person walks in the door with their laptop and they plug into your network and all of a sudden it tries to share a ransomware package. You need to know that. You need to be able to react to that immediately. So that means you're going to have to have visibility and not just visibility, but the intelligence to understand what's happening in these data flows. So you don't have to sit there and try to filter through it all yourself to figure it out. So uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, multi, multi-modal analysis, you know, not just signature-based analysis, but also behavior-based analysis, but not just behavior-based analysis, you know. So you'll need multimodal analysis. You'll need to be able to fuse multiple modes together to be able to come up with less false positives. Because if you pull lots of data and you end up with lots of false positives, your, your employees are going to get tired of the solution and they're going to stop using it. Your security professionals, no matter how good they are, if they can't get the data out of a big pile of data you send to them, they'll stop looking at that pile of data because it's going to be continuously the same results. I can't get anything out of it. So you'll need to have the technology that automatically determines what's in there that's important. To them. Um, so automation orchestration, security orchestration, automated response. Um, the uh, this, this area is another area that was in that uh, in the in the services side of the pillar slide that I showed you earlier. Uh, and it's an area that you probably have already invested in. You'll need to continue. You can't stop investing in it. It's not going to go away if part of zero trust, but it's going to have more information feeds brought into it. And then, then now this is the topic area that I really wanted to get to, and that's performance. You know, what can we do? How can we change what we're doing? What do we need to focus on in order to sure, ensure that as we roll out zero trust, that we don't impact the user's experience, the application experience. So these components in particular need to be highly performant and highly resilient, which means if one server goes down doing user authentication, you can't have user authentication stop. If one server becomes slow and you have a pool of two or three servers doing user authentication, you can't have a third of your users with a slow authentication experience. So you're going to need to know, you know, before you'll have to architect the solution so that uh, when a user is requesting an authentication or a device or an application or a network segment is requesting an, access, an authentication uh, process, that that request is always directed to uh, a device that's going to provide a fast response. So you think about that and you go, well, that's not terribly difficult to do. I've been doing this for years with my web servers, right? I got a, I got a farm of web servers and I put a load balancer in front of it and it health checks the web servers and bang off I go and I'm good to go. And you're right, it's not terribly difficult to do. It is just something you have to think about doing. You know, you need to think now that your load balancing is going to be more than just applications. It's going to be infrastructure components because those infrastructure components are going to be hammered constantly. And if they behave badly, then the user's experience is going to be bad. So you're going to have to ensure that more than just your web servers have that kind of uh, intelligent front end that ensures the users are always accessing, these requests are always being sent to something that's gonna respond fast to the request. Which authentication, authorization, privilege access management, device authentication, device authorization, device compliance, application delivery, you know, all of those areas are gonna need, you, you may have done some good work in application delivery already, but you probably haven't done as good a job. I'm, generalization, you may have done a wonderful job, but, these other components are really going to be important to look at. If you're using DNS round robin today, uh, it does not know whether any server is up or down. It does not know if any server is, is working well and it doesn't know if the application is responding quickly. DNS round robin is not a way to load balance. It is a way to um, wait for a disaster. Uh, you, you think you've got a solution in place, but then it's going to bite you and it's going to bite hard. 
um, multiple authentication servers. So you may have had a few today in a few locations. You're going to need to think about where is authentication actually being requested from. Remember, it's not going to be just from the user's device anymore. It's going to be from more, or, or the application server. It's going to be gateway decisions, access decisions to get from segment to segment out of your network. So you're going to need to look at where your authentication authorization are taking place. And again, to ensure that you have adequate performance and resilience, you're going to need to ensure that uh, you have more than one server providing the service. Um, and more than likely, if you have two today, you're going to need three, four, five, six tomorrow. Uh, you're going to have to figure out uh, how you can uh, ensure that direct the requests are being sent to ones that are working properly. Well, that's layer seven load balancing. And you're going to need to protect the actual authentication servers themselves. So minimally, you're going to need to put a reverse proxy in for security purposes so that the user authentication requests, uh, if at all possible, authentication requests shouldn't go straight to the authentication server. But if the device is allowed to talk to the server, the device is allowed to try to compromise the server. So ideally, any request for anything should go through an intermediate device, a proxy, which then refers that re request to the device that, you're, that holds the information, identity, authorization, whatever, gets a response back, and then the proxy provides it to the user. Now, the proxy is the only point of attack that the user's device can, can, can focus on. And in most cases, those are purpose-built devices. So they're... they're you know, they're not a common operating system. They're, they're an appliance operating system, which means everything's been stripped out except what's absolutely critical to make it work. So all the common network-based attacks, all the common application-based attacks don't work. You have to get very, very creative to properly uh, compromise the proxy server. So uh, anyway, it, it, it ratchets your security levels up. Uh, device compliance servers, privilege access management servers, same exact thing. You're going to need to worry about how do you spread the load across multiple copies of them. How do you deal with, uh, if you have a global organization, single site failures? You know, if I have um, the, the enclave, the micro segments that are involved in, you know, uh, base alpha that no longer support authentication processes, can I reach across the network and find uh, a peer on the network that allows me to, so global load balancing is going to be something that's really going to be important from a resiliency perspective. So if it doesn't, if it's not serviceable locally, can I get it someplace else? Can I get it from the cloud? Can I get it from another location that I have a processing infrastructure at? So that's going to be critical to you. Uh, the application layer, uh, then I talk about this and and uh, if these aren't in place today, uh, they really should be. And if they are in place today, but they're too expensive or too complicated, then they don't have to be. Uh, and uh, we can talk with you about that. But uh, the, the old paradigm, uh, you know, when I grew up in, in this world, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, in, in, in the area of building out data centers, the old paradigm was, the most expensive thing I'm putting into my data center is my load balancer. And that's not true. That is massively not true today. That is so untrue. <laughs> so um, it now becomes an affordable component to place where you need a place within your architecture to go ahead and meet your requirements. Uh, data layer. Uh, if you're not using object storage today, if you're not, if you're not addressing the, the final mitigation for a ransomware attack. Final mitigation is I got a backup copy that's relatively current and I'll restore it, right? That's that's the, the, the last thing that you want to do or have to do, but if you have to do it, you, have, you need to have it. Well, object store technology today has driven the cost of storage down so low you can actually begin to do that. So you should look seriously at doing that within your, within your architectures. Um, we talked, I talked a little bit about being able to see across your entire network. Uh, Gartner's got some good studies in this area, uh, and they've basically, you know, said that uh, visibility is more important, is probably the most important thing that you have right now that you don't have uh, in place today uh, in your networks. Uh, there's, we've, we've done a lot of analysis with customers about uh, solutions based upon either packet capture or NetFlow, flow data capture. If you don't know what flow data is, it's data about your data. 
So your routers will will can will create data, you know, front address, to address, uh, port that's being communicated on, which gives you an indication of the application that's being used. Uh, it'll show you information like how many packets, how many um, packets were sent in each direction. All that data is encapsulated uh, into something called flow data. Uh, for Cisco, it's NetFlow. For Juniper, it's JFlow. Uh, for most manufacturers out there, they now support also IPFIX, which is the open standard for flow data. But because flow data is generated lots of different places, it's possible to be to begin to collect it without spending a lot of money getting it. It's out there, but it's simply not being harvested and analyzed properly. So flow data uh, scales across an entire network where packet data really has its strengths. You know, if you need to dig deep at a single point in your network. Uh, some technologies now are available that do flow collection as the standard method for visibility of what's happening across your network with automatic triggering of packet capture uh, as necessary. So we can have a security event which says, hey, I see something, go ahead and collect all the packets associated with it and store them so I can use that later for forensics or I can use it for, dot, for, for troubleshooting, one of the two, right? I can either prosecute based upon the packet data or I can go ahead and figure out more about what's happening with my application based upon that packet data. But you can see uh, roughly 90% of your business requirements for visibility, control, response, troubleshooting, analysis can be satisfied with flow-based data. And if you're not doing flow-based collection right now across your entire architecture, uh, you should focus on that because you're not gonna have visibility, well, uh, unless you've got extremely deep pocketbooks, you're not gonna be able to put packet everywhere and then figure out how to store all of that data that packet capture generates because flow data is about, about a 500 to one ratio. Uh, 500 times more data is stored for packet capture than is stored for flow capture for the same period of time, the same amount of data that's being transmitted to the network. So uh, you need 500, 500 times the amount of storage, 500 times the amount of processing to compute and analyze the data. You know, all of that would be required if you're doing packet capture everywhere and potentially as much as 500 times the cost. You know, so uh, flow data and analysis is, is definitely a, a more efficient way of doing business and it gives you relevant actionable information. The neat thing about flow data is it also tells you information that's more than just security related. It'll tell you, you know, do I have retransmits on my network? And where are they? Do I have congestion points on my network and where are they? So it helps with network analysis as well as security analysis on your network. Um, automation and orchestration. Uh, as you begin to roll out uh, uh, technologies, uh, you've, you've probably ran into this many, many times, and that's how do I get the infrastructure, the, the application, and all of its associated dependencies deployed on all of the servers I have across my environment, and how do I keep them all at a desired baseline? Um, how do I do that when I start putting some of my stuff in the cloud and some of my stuff on-prem? How do I keep them synchronized on the same baseline? Uh, how do I identify baseline drift and how do I take action according to baseline drift? How do I apply a new patch or a new, or a new security function change within the environment? And the answer is automation and orchestration technologies. Uh, and uh, another area where you should, if you haven't focused deeply into it, uh, you should. And then uh, in, in a summary, you know, what's, what's your journey towards zero trust? You're gonna need to, as much as most people don't like to, you're gonna need to build an architecture. It's got enough moving parts in it that it's not something you can hold in your head. So you're gonna have to build an architecture, show how the, all the ins and outs for all the components in the architecture and what the functions and, and that they provide are. Uh, don't let anybody walk in and say, I'm your answer to zero trust. If, you, if they do that, you probably ought to show them the door and say, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I don't have the time <laughs> to spend with people who don't have my best interests at heart. You, know, I, you may be part of my solution, but you can't be all of my solution. Nobody has that capability today. Um, try not to pick the most complicated devices, the most complicated solutions the things with the most knobs to twist when you're trying to deploy something new. 
because the amount of time it takes to train people up to operate it properly and the more and the likelihood somebody's going to operate it improperly and cause an outage goes way up with complexity. So make complexity, make ease of use a critical decision point uh, in your acquisitions, not just does it do A, B, C, and D, but can I do it with a person that's a junior network technician that has not gone to class on your product for two weeks or three months? You know, what can I do with the technology? So make that complexity a decision point uh, in, in acquisitions. Um, avoid the trap that a lot of us have fallen into over the years of somebody walking up and saying, I do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. I do all of these things when all you need to do is A and B. Uh, and then you say, but the, and the, and the person walks in and says, yeah, but you're going to need C, D, E, F, G, you're going to need all this other stuff sometime in the future, and you just don't know it yet, so buy me, right? I've got this thing that does all of this stuff. Well, you look at it and you go, yeah, but it's going to be harder to figure out how to operate it, and it's going to cost me more money to buy it, and it's going to limit where I can deploy it because I don't have a big enough budget to deploy it everywhere I need to. Avoid overspending. Avoid that trap of somebody trying to tell you one size fits all. Everybody should have a Lamborghini-based uh, transportation device instead of there should be a certain number of Fords and a certain number of Chevys and a certain number of Toyotas. And yeah, maybe your executive needs a, needs a Cadillac, but not everybody needs the same thing. It's true in your network. Not everything needs the same expensive product to, to meet a requirement. Um, there are going to be some places you can shift investments from. Um, if you look real careful in packet and flow as an example, if you can get flow on to packet on demand with flow collection and you can do that and save yourself money, then you should start looking at doing that today. Um, the uh, this full visibility of what's happening across your network is just so important. Uh, I mean, you're not again, you're not going to catch ransomware with an antivirus package and you're not going to catch it with a firewall service. You know, not not at any level of precision. You're going to need to have something that knows what's happening and sees changes to baselines and behaviors to be able to trigger you to do something to minimize the impact of a breach in your network. Um, and then this performance resiliency is just so important uh, in everything that you're going to be doing because everything's going to be hit harder. And some places you're going to have more authentication and access. For example, if you did load balancing today and all you did was, was just load balancing, you didn't do anything else but load balancing, more of that load balancer is going to have to also be a decision access point, not authentication point, because you're going to be going from a user segment to an application segment, micro segments, multiple of them perhaps, and the architecture calls for authentication as you move between segments in a network. So now the load balancer has to support more than just load balancing, it needs to support identity as well and authorization as well. So uh, uh, this discussion talks a lot about uh, infrastructure components you've probably seen before and used before. Uh, your application engineering team might actually be one of the best places to go to talk to uh, experts that can help you understand how to apply application engineering concepts to infrastructure components so that you can scale your infrastructure components out to meet the requirements of zero trust. Um, the uh, cyber operations teams that you have today uh, th did not traditionally deal with load balancing as an example. Uh, so some of the technologies that are in the application space, because now they're going to be part of your security architecture, authentication, authorization decisions to get into the segment where the application server lives, as an example, could live in the load balancer. Your cyber operations teams are going to have to become more familiar with some of the components that they weren't familiar with before. Um, all of these pillars of zero trust, you know, realize that they all have issues with scalability, performance, availability, uh, reliability, you know, fault tolerance, uh, disaster recovery, and treat them all the same way as you would an application server in your environment. Uh, and then resilience and performance absolutely critical. Uh, so I'm into the question section. So any questions?
Thanks, Mike. And I'll invite anybody to go ahead and submit your questions. Um, see that where you have um, the ability to in the panel there um, or in the chat as well. Um, Mike, I have a few questions myself that I noted down here. Um, so I'll go ahead and work through those with you and um, anybody else that has questions, feel free to go ahead and submit those um, as you have them. Um, but Mike, first I wanted to ask here is that, you know, you told me a lot here in the last hour, um, but I wanted to ask if you could summarize how you can provide zero trust security without creating silos or disrupting the existing infrastructure. Um, I'd probably recommend that uh, customers uh, um, look at the additional demand. So first off, architecture is important. So if you can begin the process of getting an architecture in place, that's really, really important. It'll help you understand that uh, where your authentication and access control points are all going to be within your within your environment. And as you see where those access points are going to be, you can then go back and you can you can uh, extrapolate the impact upon other components in your architecture. For example, if I'm going to put an access point uh, at the in front of my email system, so the email system itself may require access decisions, but I'm going to put an access point in front of it, a new one in front of it. Uh, it's going to generate additional access requirements. Now my authentication and access control system, which is running at 70% utilization, is probably going to get up to around 80 or 90. It's time to add an additional server, right? And I didn't have load balancing in front of those application authentication servers before. Now it's a good idea to put a load balancer in front of them. I'm going to load balance access to LDAP, basically, right? Or whatever the methodology you're going to use for accessing uh, the, the authentication service. So uh, build an architecture, uh, put down where you're going to have components that are going to drive demand against your existing infrastructure components, like your identity management solutions and then began scaling out your identity management solutions in advance of dropping those components in. Because the last thing you want to do is drop an access control decision point in the middle of your network and immediately all your customers begin to, whether they're using that application or not, all of your customers see slowdown in authentication, which means slowdown in applications across the board. So uh, start off there. Appreciate that. Um, let's say I have made the decision to pursue zero trust from a security standpoint, uh, but I'm considering performance. How can I look to maintain customer trust throughout this decision? Um, what advice would you share from that perspective? Uh, major changes to your shared infrastructure um, require um, well, my, I've been most successful in my career uh, making sure that everybody, all um, parts of the organization and all leaders of all parts of the organization are informed about what we're going to do and when we're going to do it. So full visibility and transparency uh, is really important. Um, making big changes, uh, you're going to have bumps in the road. It's this in inevitable. It's going to happen. So having senior leader buy-in, having actually one of your senior leaders, the VP, the president, the base commander, the whatever, uh, have them be your sponsor for the change that you're going to make place. And let people know that this person is your sponsor for making this all happen. It will, will really help a lot in that area. Thank you. Um, another one that I had here, one of my favorite lines that you said um, throughout this presentation is that you can't manage what you can't see. And so I was wondering if you could talk about uh, some of the progress solutions and how those play into gaining visibility and intelligence within your network. Yeah, sure. Uh, I didn't want to talk products too much, at, at least not in the beginning of this, um, because we, my goal was education. But Progress, as a company, has products related to flow collection and analysis, a product we call Flowmon, which is a net flow collector and also a net flow or an IP fix generator. It has both probes, which can convert packet data into flow data for anybody's product to consume. 
and it has collectors which can collect flow data from anybody's product, including our own probes, to tell you what's happening across your network. So uh, uh, whether you're, uh, if you've gone deep into this area of flow collection, but you can't find a probe that works at 100 gigabits per second or 200 gigabits per second without sampling, sampling means you don't see all of the data. You only see some of the data. If you're doing security, uh, based analysis, you need to see all of the data. Sampling is a bad thing. If you're just doing performance monitoring, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You can get a pretty good idea what's happening from sampling and performance, but in security, you need a really good flow data. Our probes will generate that flow data, you know, with 200 megabit, 200 gigabit per second uh, input at, at a one-to-one -one ratio, at a no loss ratio. Uh, and while you're at it, I might as well mention that our, our we do offer a load balancer. It's called Loadmaster. It has a flow generator built into it as well. So all applications that are being accessed through the Loadmaster, that system generates flow data and sends it to anything that collects flow data as well. That's great, and that um, that flows right into the next question that I had lined up there is, um, what can progress specifically do to help me in my journey to achieving, um, you know, an exceptional customer experience and zero trust? So I don't know if there was any more that you wanted to add to that or emphasize. Uh, well, you know, touch us, you know, reach out and talk to us. Uh, progress has been in business for 40 years. Uh, they have recently acquired some really neat technologies. What's up gold for network management and visibility uh, is, is, was a recent acquisition from Ipswich. Uh, Chef, the, old, the old, old project on automation and orchestration for software deployment across large in, inter, enterprises, including cloud environments. You know, how do you get to desired state management? It's all right in that, ba right in that basket that Chef provides. Uh, Loadmaster and Flowmon, uh, you know, load balancing that is affordable and easy to use, you know, and it's on the DOD approved products list. So it's already gone through the most rigorous security testing you can, you can imagine. And yet it's still affordable. And how is that possible? It's because when Loadmaster was built, it was built for the smaller customers and grew into the larger customers. So we grew into the, you know, 100 gigabit connected load balancers. But we started off servicing a customer set that could not afford dedicated specialists for load balancing. So we had to build a product that could be operated by a network tech, a junior network tech. So we did. Um, in the area of uh, um, secure file transfer, uh, information sharing, coalition partnerships, uh, we have a product called Move It, which is uh, you know, HIPS compliant, HIPAA compliant, um, managed file transfer. Either it can be uh, off off-prem, we can offer a cloud-based service, or it can be all on-prem in your own servers. So all of these things can come together uh, to go ahead and really ratchet up uh, your security posture, right? You can put load balancing where you need it, not, not where you have, only where you could afford it. That, that becomes an easy decision point. Now you put load balancing where you need it. You can have visibility across your entire network with flow on. You can go ahead and deal with uh, information sharing in a secure manner with full auditability uh, with things like Move It. Um, you can deal with automation orchestration of application deployments across broad infrastructure variants with with Chef. So uh, yeah, it, it's and, and and what's up gold? You know the the built by the Army for the Army and used during the Gulf War to actually manage the the networks we had in place. I did that personally, so I know what we were doing, um, and. Uh, Definitely the easiest to use network management tool out there as well. Awesome, thank you, Mike. I was just going to ask one last question here. Um, and just in summary, you taught us a lot today. There's a lot of great material that you jam packed in there. Um, but if there was one thing that I needed to remember from this presentation, what would that be? Um, zero trust uh, is going to impact things that work well today by applying additional load to them to the point they're not going to work well tomorrow. 
So you can't just add components to get the zero trust. You have to increase the resiliency, the performance, the capacity of your existing uh, authentication authorization access control solutions as you make the journey. You must do that or you're going to end up with all of your customers being mad at you all at the same time. Uh, and uh, it, it'll be a major detriment to both you and your career, as well as your ability to get the zero trust deployed. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I see no other questions. And so we will wrap up today's webinar session. Uh, thank you to all that attended and joined us today. Uh, and thank you, Mike, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, this recording will be available to everyone, whether you attended a portion of this or um, couldn't make it, we will send that out via email uh, here later this week and you will have access to that. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us or visit progress.com for uh, more answers to your questions. So thank you so much. and. Uh, have a wonderful day.